Hello, hello. Hello, DataBees. Thank you for joining us today. We're super excited about today's event, the Digital Twin Smackdown. So we're going to just give it 20 more seconds here since we're starting a little bit early, let a couple more people come in the room, and then I'm going to briefly introduce myself and what the Hive Think Tank does and kind of let you know how today's event is going to go. So without further ado, hello, my name is Maddie Watt. I am the Senior Manager of People and Programs at The Hive, and I help lead The Hive Think Tank. Thank you for all joining today. If you're a returning member, awesome. And if you're new, welcome. Uh, today, we have an event with some amazing tech executives on digital twins, and it is a smackdown today, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm going to let our moderator, Kamesh, tell you a little bit more about that later. But first, really quickly, I want to let you guys know how today is going to work. And I'm just going to mention one or two things about the Hive Think Tank. So today for our event, it is being recorded. It will be automatically emailed out to everyone tomorrow. So if <laughs> You have a friend that wasn't able to join on the call. Don't worry, you'll get the recording link and you can share it with them. Uh, and we want you to ask questions today. We love questions. I hope you brought your best and burning questions for these gentlemen. So to do that, you're gonna use the Q&A button. And if you look at your screen right below the video, you'll see there's a button and it's Q&A. So you just type your question in there and that's awesome because then everyone can upvote on different questions they wanna see answered the most. And it helps if it's not in the chat because it's hard for the moderator to keep track of the chat while also keeping track of the questions. So if I see you ask a question in the chat, I am going to ask you to use the Q&A button. Okay, so that's it. Thanks, everyone. And to let you know a little bit about the Hive Think Tank. So we are an ecosystem of entrepreneurs, corporations, and thought leaders. We are a community that is robust with different bustling minds and thinking about all these things about AI and blockchain and enterprise and entrepreneurship. And we're bringing you these events where we can talk about these things almost every week, about every week or every other week. And we're doing it all virtually right now. We look forward to hosting events in person again one day. And we also feature a blog that talks about all of these uh, topics as well. So I will drop the chats for our blog as well as our meetup link. And that is the best way for you to stay up to date on all of our events. And I will drop that later in the chat. Next slide, Robbie please. Thank you. And a thank you to our sponsors. If you want to work with us, please reach out to me. I'll drop my email in the chat. Um, special shout out to Tipco, who's also on the call. Thank you, Michael. Woo -woo. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Ravi. Oh, but before I forget, thank you. Uh, we have an event next Thursday that you definitely don't want to miss. This is going to be a keynote with retired JPL fellow and a new CEO and founder of Astrolabs Enterprises, Leon Alkali. And he is an incredible guy who's going to tell us all about entrepreneurship in space and the emerging space economy. Super interesting stuff. So I will drop the link to that, register, hope to see you next week, and thank you guys for joining us today. Thank, thank you, Maddie. So just a brief introduction of, of the Hive. So the Hive is a uh, early stage venture capital fund focused on AI and applications and use cases of AI in the enterprise and a broad set of uh, industries that you see here on the top. Our focus is very thematic. And so we spend, I would say, 70% of our time exploring the themes that you see in the kind of middle layer. And on the bottom, you see a set of technologies um, where, and I'm pleased that today Rob is here from Ericsson uh, because of the 5G connection. Uh, and, and so you see a set of technologies that we tend to use to kind of break open these, these opportunities. Um, if you're an entrepreneur um, anywhere in the globe, reach out to us. Um, uh, if you are a corporation would like to partner with us, please reach out to us. So we have, uh, during the pandemic, in addition to um, uh, making tons of progress in the hive, just this month in the hive, we've had three exits and, and we expect another exit in the hive Brazil sometime soon in the next 30, 45 days. But we've also created the hive Southeast Asia in partnership with the government of Malaysia. And we are exploring the hive MENA uh, in collaboration with uh, Aramco. And we have done a number of things with uh, Aramco. They have co-invested in two of our companies, Falcon and Zaid Security. And if there are any European
Europeans here today. So keep an eye open for the Hive uh, Europe based in Berlin and Paris in partnership with the European Investment Fund. With that, uh, I'd like to introduce my colleague and partner, Kamesh Rathwenda. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Hive Think Tank, first ever SmackDown. Uh, you might have been uh, uh, intrigued by the word SmackDown. Uh, so we're going to deviate from the generally moderate tone of panel discussions. I'm sure many of you might even have been bored of the general uh, method of uh, approving generally accepted market views and not challenging uh, unless it's proven wrong. Um, on the contrary, in this new event format of a SmackDown, uh, we're going to critically beat down the topic that we have chosen today until we hear the real metallic clang of reality. Uh, you're going to see a very different tone, a very different tenor, uh, and we look forward to getting feedback on this new format of organizing an event, uh, quite different from standard uh, panel discussions. Uh, we solicit and welcome uh, contrarian views, uh, hard questions, uh, challenging what is generally accepted in the market, and we're going to celebrate, discuss, debate uh, the, those types of views. Uh, we chose the topic of district wins uh, for our first ever SmackDown because of the audacity of the promise that district wins bring. Uh, district win has the promise of being the mother of all platforms, much bigger, much more ambitious than what cloud computing was, what mobile was that we have seen evolve over the course of the last decade. Cloud computing, as we know, redefined the way software was developed, software was hosted, software was served with a completely different cloud-based economics. Mobile has redefined the way we interact with each other, the way we do commerce, the way we interact with organizations and government. Uh, but digital twins come in with the promise of redefining the way we interact with the physical world, period. Anything that's physical, that either us or any of our machines interact with, digital twins are promising to touch that to improve that, to enhance that, to automate that, to change the way we behave in the physical world. And therefore, it's, it's a very big promise. I'm sure those of you who have seen market researches and, and kind of the scale of the market size, you would have seen market sizes in the hundreds of billions, sometimes trillions of dollars. Uh, and this is the kind of scale of disruption uh, that digital twins are supposed to uh, provide us. And some of you might also have seen some early indications of the scale. The way today you interact with your semi-autonomous car or the way you interact with your smart home is fundamentally different than how you would drive a car or, or go about in your home even seven, eight years ago. Uh, and kind of extrapolating this to all kinds of industrial engineering, all kinds of operations, whether it's transportation, logis logistics, aviation, and, and, and kind of the scale of the applications, the scale of the market. Uh, that is what we are up against, and that is what we're going to beat down uh, in this conversation today. Um, uh, and, and obviously, we have a, a equally uh, kind of uh, capable and, and, and war-weathered panel uh, who have really worked with digital twins over last decade, or perhaps even beyond the last decade, uh, who have seen the good, bad, and particularly the ugly side of digital twins, uh, who are going to come sit down with us and show us what is reality and what is just a promise. Uh, so with us, we have today uh, Rob Tiffany, who is the Vice President and Global Head of IoT Strategy at Ericsson. Uh, obviously, all of us have heard about 5G and the promise 5G brings to uh, uh, IoT and digital twins. Uh, we also have uh, Michael O'Connell, who is the Chief Analytics Officer of SIPCO. Uh, we obviously know that data, AI, data-driven analytics are going to play a transformative role uh, in how digital twins are going to evolve. So we'd love to hear more and learn more from Michael there. Uh, we also have with us Greg Fallon, who is the CEO of Geminus, uh, our own portfolio company within the Hive, focusing on digital twins and making digital twins real. Uh, so you'll also get a sneak peek uh, into what the Hive is doing uh, around digital twins there. Uh, before I hand it over to our illustrial, illustrious panelists uh, to introduce the topic, introduce themselves, I want to pose a challenge question to the audience. Um, I want the audience members to think of uh, one or two physical world interactions that they're today having, uh, which they feel can, can do with some significant change, some improvement, some automation. It could be something in your personal life, like picking out the trash. It could be something in your work life, like making the damn tablets and laptops work in an office conference room. These are challenges that we all face on a day-to-day basis. Uh, you'll also see uh, our panelists weigh in on, on what they think is the biggest, most significant physical interaction that really needs to change with digital twins. 
Uh, before hand, handing it over to Rob, I'll, I'll also spell out my answer. Um, I believe uh, the aspect of our interaction with the physical world that has been the most irresponsible and the most reckless is our interaction with the ecology of this planet. Um, and I feel that interaction can do a lot good by augmenting it with the power of data, with the power of digital twins, with the power of sensors monitoring how we engage with the ecology. Um, in particular there, uh, I'm particularly a big fan of this initiative called the End of Plastic Waste Consortium in Europe, uh, which is essentially created to monitor the petrochemical supply chain and how plastic uh, is being recycled or dispersed, and especially the level of plastic in the oceans uh, is quite uh, alarmingly increasing. Um, so I, I, I would challenge digital twins with a plastic digital twin that can track, monitor, and, and shepherd every piece of plastic ever manufactured and make sure they are moved away from the ocean. Um, so in my, uh, from my point of view, it's a bigger initiative around uh, role of digital twins in sustainable supply chain. Uh, it also happens to be an area that uh, we are working actively within the hive. You'll see us uh, add a company in our portfolio that is going to focus on uh, making supply chains sustainable by leveraging digital twins. Um, enough from me. Uh, very eager to hear uh, what our uh, panelists uh, have to, have to uh, tell us. Uh, so I'll hand it over to Rob uh, and, and look forward to this wonderful event. I also see a lot of questions coming in, uh, especially Harsha Shivasa, who weighed in very early on, uh, pretty much asking, is our digital twins just an MVP business or is there something real going on? Uh, so over, and, uh, over to you, Rob. Rob, before you get started, I have a confession. Okay. When I was in my 20s, I would wake up, I think it was Sunday mornings, to watch the WWF. So I have the same sort of anticipation here today. You know, <laughs> like seeing kind of men, grown up men in mass beat the pulp part of each other or pretend to beat the pulp part of each other. So <laughs> go on in the SmackDown arena. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's great. Wow. Well, hopefully we don't disappoint with this SmackDown. That means so I'm Rob Tiffany. I'm the VP and head of IoT strategy at Ericsson. Um, if you don't know who Ericsson is, we make cellular hardware, the gear, antennas, radio access networks, core systems. So basically, it's kind of like Intel inside. We sell a te cellular technology to the mobile operators around the world so that your phone and IoT devices can be connected. And yes, we make that 5G stuff that everybody's talking about. I would say no matter what I'm doing in IoT, it just is totally getting drowned out by the 5G megatrend that's happening right now as we roll that out around the world. Um, the other thing I do is uh, uh, on the side, I'm an executive director of Beautiful Arches. Um, this is all about using digital twins, kind of like what Kamesh was talking about, digital twins around sustainability. Um, I've actually built a digital twin platform, and it's totally designed, if you're familiar with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals uh, around poverty, hunger, water issues, you know, the climate. It's actually the goal of that is to apply digital twin IoT technology uh, to help solve some of those big challenges. You know, after a while, you realize this technology can be used for things besides business. Uh, it absolutely be used to, to help society. Um, I think I got my start in digital twins in 2016 um, when I went to work for Hitachi. I was there to design uh, and, and bring to market an industrial IoT platform called Lumata. And so in creating that giant, you know, kind of for manufacturing and transportation and uh, industrial IoT platform, it was really clear to me that digital twins actually belong at the heart of any IoT systems. You know, uh, I really think that digital twins kind of are at that intersection of IoT uh, and, and AI. They kind of sit in the middle, you know, you need, the, the IoT is, is, the, is the blood flow, it's the nervous system bringing the information but you're hydrating and you know solidifying that inside the twins, and then your analytics and AI uh, works against the digital information on the twins, and so that actually worked out really well. We actually called them asset avatars, um, and I know you're probably thinking of like seven or eight foot blue alien creatures, um, and you can go with that. But some you know a lot of people really related to the term avatar, making a lot of sense to them. So I'm gonna kick off the session here, just kind of real quick. I wanna just kind of give you some basics 
around digital twins. For those of you who don't know anything about them, because uh, I know they seem mysterious, they were certainly mysterious to me. I remember the first time I saw back in the 90s, I was uh, doing some work for Boeing. You know, I remember the first time they were using the Katia system from Dassault Systems to design their first ever airplane digitally instead of doing it on paper and blueprints. Uh, and so that was my first inkling that, hey, you know, there's another digital way to build things. And as you've probably heard, maybe, you know, digital twins can be used in the design phase of a product. You could design the product, you know, digitally before you create the physical product. Um, digital twins can work at runtime, you know, operationally when the machine is running and you're getting telemetry and you're finding out, you know, its current state. Um, and, and lots of uses there. So I'm going to kind of talk up. So if I, the first, uh, I've kind of thrown out a bunch of articles I've written together uh, in, in a couple of slides here to do it quickly with some pictures. There's the idea of a digital twin, the instance of a digital twin. Let's just use a car as an example, because it's something everyone understands. You've got a car, you've got an engine, four tires, you know, transmission, steering wheel. You know, when you look at your car dashboard, especially if you have newer ones, there's all these indicator lights and lots of information that you never saw before. Think of that as like your IoT technology really on steroids. Now, obviously, IoT is taking that sensor information and usually wirelessly taking it somewhere else where you can manage it. But that kind of gives you a sense. So I've seen a lot of uh, IoT platforms go down the path of kind of creating what they would think of as a data schema, which is kind of a precursor to a full-blown digital twin. Uh, and you're setting properties, you know, four tires, the tire pressure in the right front tire, things like that. And you're having to do it over and over again. A digital twin, I mean, the first thing I'll talk about is something called a digital twin model. So think of this as a, an asset class, or if you're an object-oriented programmer, you think of it as a base class that you may inherit from to be really geeky here. You wanna create it and define it one time and then inherit it a million times if that's what you need to. So this is just a helper. So if I'm gonna, if I've got a car, let's let's say it's a Toyota Prius, I might create a digital twin model of the Prius, and it's a certain, you know, 19, you know 2015 Toyota Prius, uh, and it has certain characteristics, and then all the properties I'm gonna set on that thing um, are based at that that class level. There'll be your Toyota Prius and Kamesh's Prius and everyone else's Prius. Those are instances of the digital twin. So we define it once. And the first thing you'll do is these things called telemetry properties. Think of those as a one-to-one -one relationship with sensors that the car has. It's giving you information. It's telling you how fast it's going. It's telling you how much fuel is left. Not that you need very much in a Prius. It's telling you the pressure in the tires. It's telling you a lot of things. So that's kind of the first thing. And so you can imagine that at your instance, the real physical Prius, is sending telemetry, probably wireless, as it's driving around into your IoT digital twin platform. And those the digital version is being brought to life. And so it knows the current state of the digital twin and the historical state, which is the overall life cycle of that Prius will be is what we call a digital thread. So there's another kind of property uh, called a virtual property. This one's a weird one. It, there's not a one-to-one -one match with a physical sensor, for instance. Uh, if you've ever been a database administrator and you ever had something called a calculated column it, where a bunch of columns in a database kind of are calculated together or maybe with some other data to derive what goes into those rows of a database, it's kind of like that. So I'll give you an example back with a car. There's no such thing as a sensor that tells you how, how many miles per hour or kilometers per hour you're going. It's actually a combination of information coming from different sensors and they do an on the fly calculation to tell you on your display, you're going 35 miles an hour. So that's an example of a virtual property, the speed. There's no one-to-one -one mapping and we put it together. There's also, if you kind of look here to the bottom and notice how I've cleverly put together all these buildings that seem to have twins of each other. Um, static properties. This is not as interesting, but it's when you want to model whatever the thing is, you need to know it. These are this is, these are properties about a, a thing, a, a physical object that don't change at all or don't change very often. So a static property can be the car is 20 feet long, the fuel tank holds 20 gallons of gasoline, things like that, things that don't change. Um, 
that is also important though when you're doing simulations and things like that. Like if I have, if I say the the, the height of a certain uh, windmill turbine, you know, that generates electricity is you know 200 feet tall, and when you're trying to you'll you'll map that to dynamic properties and maybe the flow of wind against it to see how far it's going to lean. Um, another thing is called command properties. So a lot of times you think of IoT and you think of data telemetry flowing one way, uh, but sometimes you have things called control systems where you send a command back to the machine. So you can define properties for a machine. Let me give you a quick example. Let's say you have an electric motor and the motor is running at 10,000 revolutions per minute, 10,000 RPM. And so it's sending you that telemetry. And so the, the digital version of the motors saying, yeah, it's going this fast. Oh, but the temperature I notice is a thousand degrees and this thing is about to melt down. You may, your analytics will say, uh oh, that's not good. Uh, we need to chill that thing out. And so you may send a command back to that motor to slow it down to maybe 7,500 RPM. And then you'll notice the cooling happens and, and that's all good. So you, you'll, you'll, you may have command properties for things that support that. The last thing on the slide is just the idea of, of rules. You know, the first thing you're doing when data is coming in and the twin is you might just do some pattern matching. You've got all these data, uh, uh, right front tire, pressure, PSI is the unit of measure. The data type might be an integer or a floating point. All these things are supposed to help your analytics. That's what you want to do is be a helper for your analytics. Uh, don't make it too hard for that. It's hard enough to have clean data. If you don't know what it's looking, what's coming at it, it makes it harder for the analytics to do its job. And so you can actually, normally you think of analytics as being separate from all this other stuff, but you can create KPIs inside your twin model. You might say, well, for the right front tire pressure, I expect it to be at 32 PSI. And you might specify a green range and a yellow and a red. And then you might have rules that happen when the event fires that it goes out of that range. And then it can apply certain analytics to that. So we can move just one more slide here. Uh, I kind of mentioned the digital twin instances. That's the actual current version of the twin. Yeah, you know, again, you'll have this historical thing happening over time. Um, and so if you think of every, you know, every time you're getting new telemetry and you're hydrating that twin with the latest data, that's that current instance of the state, the health, the performance of whatever that thing is. And then remember, you've, kept, you, you, you've got time series information. So you've got data going back all the way to the birth of that device. That whole thing is the digital thread. Trust me, I used to think the digital thread was something else too, just like you did. Uh, I figured it out, you know, I'm an idiot just like anybody else. Uh, and that historical thread, you know, you can use that to compare. What if you have a fleet of cars and you notice one of them at 60,000 miles, the fuel pump goes out. And then you notice a bunch of them. You can compare the threads over time of the same types of cars and go, hey, this is a problem. We should do a recall. And remember, we're using IoT and digital twins also to improve our products over time. So let's jump into subsystems. Sometimes you have a machine that's so complex that it has subsystems that deserve their own twin. So let's go back to the car. The car is a twin, but maybe the engine should be its own twin. It's got so many complex moving parts that you create a twin for that. It'll have a parent-child relationship with the whole car and then causal relationships with its properties that map to properties of the whole car. And so you can assign rules and patterns there to say, hey, and just like problems you may have had with your own car, some subsystem of your car has a problem, but it's not enough to cause your whole car to have a problem. But then sometimes you've been to the shop and the guy says, yeah, you know, you got about 10,000 more miles and the whole thing's going to die because this subsystem bubbles up to the whole car and it's no bueno. Uh, digital twins and groups, kind of like subsystems. So let's talk about uh, manufacturing. You have a bunch of industrial robots on an assembly line. They're all twins of those. They probably have complex subsystems. They're all doing their job on the assembly line. That assembly line is a group. It's a collection of industrial robots. But it couldn't, it doesn't have to just be a dumb group. It could be a digital twin unto itself with its own properties. And then the properties and state of all those industrial robots bubble up to something that looks like a group, but we would call it an assembly line. You can kind of get the idea of how you end up can create a like a Russian doll that ultimately becomes your whole factory. Lots of assembly lines together is your factory. And then pretty soon you see a living organism with inputs coming in, supply chain, things going out, 
raw materials and how you can model that whole thing. Uh, the last part that I want to talk about before handing it off to Michael is the idea of processes. You may not think you can do process stuff with twins, but you can. You can have process properties. You know, you know what a process is. It's like a bunch of linear steps, maybe not always linear. You know, I'm a farmer. I check the weather to see if I need to go water my crops. I'm a person walking into a room and the room knows the light needs to come on. The temperature needs to be comfortable for me, a bunch of steps like that. Those in the past, you could write lots of code and, and analytics or, you know, or stuff like that to make that happen. But you can do it in twins. You can have process properties in twins where the twin of the room is kind of like that group. And the things are, that are inside that room are components of it. And, they, and, and there's an orchestration that can happen where the process properties and also remember, it's APIs, it's data, it's the twin that's defining the what and what to do. And then it's bots, it's software agents that bring the whole thing to life. It's always software that's alive. It sees the incoming data, you walked into the room, it looks at the twin, the twin says, when this person comes in, we know who that person is, they like it to be 72 degrees, we need the lights on this much. I think you get the idea. You can orchestrate processes with twins, which is a really cool feature. And I am out. I'm going to pass it on to Michael. Thanks, thanks a lot, Rob. Uh, you made this thing look very tall and strong. Uh, Michael, <laughs> before handing, handing it over to you, I want to just relay some audience questions and comments. Uh, a bunch of people, I think David, Harsha, Sanjeev, are challenging why the hell do we call it twins? Uh, they should be n tuples or triplets. Uh, they don't see duality, they see multiplicity. Uh, they especially talk about observation, simulation, and prediction, each being yeah. a twin on its own merit. Uh, so, so would love uh, your uh, uh, opinion on that, Michael. Uh, and also a smackdown uh, back to Rob. Uh, Jason comments that it's not just a thread, it's a loop because it goes back to the physical world. I just wanted to call out Jason's comment. Uh, by the way, Jason, loud your uh, Lego digital twin link. Uh, I'm not sure if all the uh, audience members can see that. Uh, I forgot to mention, I think our kids experience a lot more digital twins that we more than we ever have, especially in the world of gaming. Uh, the amount of virtual reality and gaming uh, and what is happening today, it's all digital twin. There is no semblance of the physical world. Every interaction is digital. Anyway, over and uh, out to you, uh, Michael. Yeah, very good. Um, so uh, I'm a chief analytics officer at Tipco. I work with our customer product teams. I run our Tipco data science team, uh, field team and engineering team. You know, we build AI apps and tech tools. Um, especially in uh, industries like uh, manufacturing and uh, equipment, energy sector for you know, man optimizing, uh, managing asset health and surveillance. Uh, we do a bunch of modeling and simulation work, including digital twins uh, to uh, uh, detect anomalies and uh, optimize performance. Uh, we have some pretty cool applications and uh, you know, uh, I'm gonna talk a couple of those, uh, high-tech manufacturing, uh, where we're looking at, if you go to the next slide, uh, we, we look at, uh, you know, systems uh, at the uh, design level, um, you know, also at the uh, uh, process level. Uh, and then we're measuring, you know, the yield or the output, if you can go into the next slide. Uh, so those are three areas each have their own kind of digital twin aspect to them. And you can build the slide from this uh, as we're understanding you know, design of the product and factory, uh, you know, operations and process from, slow down on the build there, <laughs> uh, you know, from specifications to deployment and, uh, validation verification going back around that loop but we're trying to get uh, you know good yield out of the uh, out of the process uh, and and so uh, you know we we have uh, models for yield we have I mean, build this build the slide again here so the digital twin for the design of the of the systems in the factory uh, the uh, the production uh, uh, can press build on the slide uh, as well as the uh, performance so there's three kinds of areas of digital twinning that we do in the high-tech manufacturing space I'm going to give you a quick uh, tour of what we do with yield because uh, you know, that's kind of amazing. I mean, we're down at na 10 nanometer type scale when we're building like uh, flash memory and so on. If you think about your hair, uh, you know, the, the width of your hair is 100 micrometers. So we're 10,000 times smaller than the diameter of the human hair as we're doing the, the yield optimization and you know, cranking out you know, the dyes off the wafer that have the electrical properties to... Um, you know, instantiate memory and all the things that we get used to in our, in our phone. Uh, so if you go into the into the next slide, you know the models that we build for yield. We're trying to predict yield and yield failure modes as a function of literally millions of process parameters. You're taking measurements across 
you know, time series on uh, from sensor data as well as physical measurement data. And each of the steps in the process as you're laying down, say, 96 layers at nanometer scale uh, on a chip with a, a mask and etch process and, and lining those up to uh, get the properties that you need uh, to support the memory requirements that, of the chip you're building, for example, there's lots and lots of variables at each stage of that process, that uh, physical measurement data, as well as virtual metrology type measures and build the slide. Uh, as, we, uh, as we look at um, you know, the, the yield and the properties of the wafer on this, uh, on this spot fire dashboard here, uh, and uh, understanding uh, the, uh, the failure modes as well as the yield as a function of all of those process parameters. Um, you know, build the slide uh, from there. So we have a digital model, in this case, a digital twin model for yield as a function of all those uh, you know, thousands of, uh, of, of process parameters. Uh, and build the slide again. Uh, and uh, you know, we're, we're monitoring the, the equipment, we're doing uh, process control measurement, you know, SPC type you know, methods. Uh, to understand variability in this and and build uh, build the model and and uh, you know iterate then uh, that that model as we learn more about it. So the components of this also have virtual nature to them, as we're you know monitoring and measuring the properties of the of the wafer you know based on the equipment parameters. There's sensor data involved. There's physical measurement. There's virtual metrology measurements that are feeding into this, uh, and that notion of um, of uh, understanding the sources of variability to control the process in an advanced kind of closed loop way, you know, detect the anomalies, have run to run control, you know, um, optimize the yield. Uh, that yield model, um, you know, the digital twin for yield uh, is an important, uh, you know, part of the uh, part of the process. So, you know, the, the TIPCO technology that's involved in this, you know, our connected intelligence portfolio you know, we're well known for connecting uh, different source systems, you know, literally hundreds of connectors that we have, you know, to different, uh, different sources. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, to connect us to, to, to data, to then unify different data sources, whether they're uh, arriving in real time or whether they're, uh, you know, at rest sources. You know, Rob mentioned, you know, some of that. Uh, the com combination of real time and at rest sources is our unified part of the uh, connected intelligence platform. And then finally, the predict part where we're doing the AI, machine learning, visual analytics. Uh, so very much, uh, you know, we're trying to do a smackdown here, but I find myself agreeing with a bunch of what Rob said. I mean, you think about uh, digital twin, you've got the IoT kind of connecting part of it, the unification of data. And then you've got the AI ML part of it that is, you know, in this case, modeling uh, the yield um, of, a, of a manufacturing process. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, uh, so that TIPCO Connected Intelligence Portfolio has those three bits to it, you know, the connect uh, and uh, integrate on the event stream, uh, the unification of the at rest and real time data sources and data management around those, and then the predict part of um, having, you know, building the model in this case to, you know, predict the yield. Uh, so that's real fun to work at that nanometer scale. Um, you know, the other thing though, as we go, we like to work on fast data too, um, you know, some of our uh, you know, we've got one product, I know it's got a bit of an arrogant name to it, but one of our messaging products is called FTL, you know, faster than light. That's underneath uh, a lot of the trading platforms that uh, folks use, uh, where we're, you know, literally, uh, um, you know, moving things at, uh, you know, extreme velocity uh, to account for people doing algorithmic trading and, and, and real-time trading type uh, scenarios. So, uh, you know, we do like to go fast. We, one of our hashtags is TIPCO fast. Uh, and uh, one of our big digital twin collaborations is with the Mercedes AMG Petronas F1 team, uh, where we've got you know 300 or so sensors on the car um, on the, on practice day and, and qualifying day at least. We take some of those off for race day, but we're getting around 65,000 channels of time series data, less than one second increments. We come away from each um, race weekend with, with about half a terabyte of data, uh, and we're getting data off all those things that uh, that Rob uh, Rob mentioned. Uh, as we kind of analyze how to set up the car and, and uh, you go to the next slide, uh, we have digital twin models for the car setup, um, you know, also for the car R&D as we're doing the R&D and building the car, like um, ma managing the aerodynamic or properties or optimizing aerodynamic properties. We've got uh, digital twins around, around doing that. Uh, but the car setup is what I'm focused on here. As we go into each race weekend, we do a ton of pre-race simulations. We test in the millions of parameters in the and in the millions of um, 
uh, settings on those parameters, we end up with doing billions of combinations of the parameters. We're looking for the, the optimal combination for that upcoming race with that track, you know, that curvature, that, uh, that set of corners, uh, you know, that sort of, of surface that we understand it to be. Uh, so we build out uh, from the digital twin model, we do all these simulations, uh, you know, adjusting things like the ride height, suspension, car balance, the tires and so on. Uh, the uh, engineers literally take uh, those simulations, you know, inside of our Spotify product on their laptops to the track. They're tweaking those simulations on the, on the plane, on the way there even. Uh, and then as they get to the track, understanding the track surface, the, the, the weather conditions, uh, the drivers take the cars out for those first couple laps. They come back and they have a conversation. Hey, did you have to understeer, oversteer going into that corner? What the ride height feel like? Um, in, and the, between the uh, trackside engineers and the drivers, they literally go into the simulations and tweak them uh, you know, in between the settings that they might've done in the, in the initial simulations to get the optimal, optimal setup. And uh, the slide that I've got here, that's Toto Wolf, you know, the CEO of, uh, of uh, Mercedes uh, uh, AMG, AMG Mercedes Formula One team. Uh, at the bottom screenshot is him speaking at our recent TIPCO Now conference, talking about some of this work that we do collaboratively with the team around uh, pre-race simulations. And then top there is him uh, trackside at one of the recent events. Uh, we've got a real fight on our hands this year. Uh, the Red Bull car is really fast. Uh, we were able to beat it out in the first race. They beat us out in the second race. Uh, it's got a pretty interesting uh, aerodynamic setup. Um, we're you know, trying to find every bit of downforce we can get. I mean, these cars are like an upside down plane. They would literally take off and fly if you don't keep them on the ground. So a lot of the optimization around aerodynamics and uh, setup and so on is around the downforce, optimizing the downforce. Um, but yeah, the, the work that we're doing, getting the car ready for the weekend um, is a you know, ongoing thing uh, from the factory all the way to the track. And, the, and Toto and James Allison, the, the other head of the operations, uh, get with the two drivers, Lewis and Valtteri. Uh, they huddle around uh, the pre-race simulations we've done that suggest the certain uh, setup parameters that we're going to go with. Um, and based on that, uh, you know, the practice sessions, we then go into the qualifyings on Saturday and three sec set sets of those. There's a lot of regulations in F1 about what car tires you can use and what you have to use in the practice versus what you are then mandated to use to start the race. Um, you know, there's uh, cost caps uh, on, on all the R&D that make uh, analytics, you know, really important. Um, it's, a, it's a challenging sport, um, you know, high budgets, um, fast cars and, uh, uh, you know, it's a really, uh, it's a great pleasure for us to work on these sorts of digital twin type models. And we, we keep track of the, uh, of the parameter and set up, um, set up, you know, during the season as we learn from race to race. Uh, and, you know, we uh, have this body of data that we're simulating from, but we learn every week, we learn more and more. Uh, and we, you know, do things like, uh, you know, the, the foundation of these, of, of the, of the digital twin models is, uh, is, is very much, you know, rooted in, uh, uh, you know, differential equation type um, modeling. Uh, but then we do all this empirical modeling on top of that uh, to tweak that. So when we get the expected value of the various parameters from the, uh, from the engineering models, and then we look at what actually happened, we've got various deltas. And then we start modeling those deltas in terms of the configuration parameters and understand, you know, what are the important variables in closing that gap. And, and as we learn uh, going through the season, we keep track of, uh, of the configurations of the car going into each, uh, each weekend. Um, but no, fascinating to, with Rob's setup, um, how you know, very much we've got a set of IoT type connectors. The IoT part of it is like the nervous system. And then the AI part is like the brain on top of that, that we do the simulations from uh, the digital twin models and uh, you know, match up the empirical results to the, to the predicted results and, and get the best setup of the car. And, and these guys go so fast and, and there's so little between them that you know, every 10th of a second really matters. Um, and every you know, part of the strategy is informed you know, from, uh, from these models. Uh, so anyway, I'll stop there and- uh, Hey, Michael, uh, would, it be, would it be better if the driver was a twin instead? That's <laughs> kind of fully integrated with the car? Yeah, yeah well, actually we do have this driver in loop simulator that we run uh, yeah. that, that gets at that a little bit. Funny you should mention that, but yeah, there's the, the car simulations and then we have a driver in loop simulation uh, model that keeps rolling so that when we get feedback from the driver about you know, how the corner understeer, oversteer and so on, we've already kind of have got a digital twin for the driver plus the car that we can make those adjustments. So 
Yeah, you might have thought it was a funny question, but we actually do do that as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like wondering. Yeah, no, sorry, go ahead, Rob. I'm going to pop on here week. really. Oops, sorry. Hi, this is Maddie, everyone. I'm interrupting just for a minute. Uh, this conversation is so incredible. Robots and driving these cars. Oh, and I think we have a lag from Rob. Um, you guys are asking a lot of great questions, and this is a question for the speakers as, and as well as the audience. If you guys are able to stay on, we would like to extend the session for another 30 minutes. So, Greg, I know you messaged me that you can stay. Michael, Rob, I don't know if you are free to stay, but we would love to keep going. So if you guys can join us, please stay on for another 30 minutes. Thank you. Awesome. We have more SmackDown uh, coming up. Uh, by the way, Michael, thanks a lot for that uh, uh, great set of insights. I'm sure you made a bunch of us very jealous uh, of the glamour in your job. Uh, as I hand it over to Greg, uh, Greg, I also want to lump some questions uh, that I feel you could address in your introductory comments. Uh, Sanjeev is asking about the cost of digital twins, all the great simulation that we saw Michael present. Uh, what's the moolah? You know, how much it's going to cost? Is it even affordable for many of the use cases? Um, uh, Greg, also, Olivier is asking about processes. Uh, Rob touched upon it in his introductory comments. Uh, but what does it entail to capture an end to end industrial process? Um, and Leonard, in particular, is asking about the manufacturing yield. Uh, Greg, I thought uh, you, you might also be touching upon that topic. Uh, with that, uh, over to you, Greg. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Kamesh. And, uh, and thanks so much for having me. So I'm the CEO of Geminis. Uh, we're a startup focused on uh, digital twins. And we're taking a new approach to digital twins. And it's, it's really a model-based approach that I want to talk to you about. Uh, my background is really in static and dynamic uh, digital twins, to use Rob's uh, language there. So I came uh, from a simulation background. I started my career in uh, computational fluid dynamics uh, with a company named Fluent, uh, migrated to ANSYS, uh, and then Autodesk. And I uh, spent most of my career thinking about design twins. But really, over the last two years, I've been thinking more and more about operational twins uh, and how you take these things that we were doing in design and morph them into operations. And that's really where, where Geminis sits. Uh, so we're focused on industrial processes, specifically uh, physical um, uh, industrial flow processes uh, right now. So things like water, semiconductor, consumer products, energy and life sciences and creating uh, twins of these plants. Uh, there's three things that we're thinking about in these processes. One is most of these manufacturing processes, if not all manufacturing processes in general, have some aspect of complex, uh, unseen, and difficult to measure uh, phenomena. In this case, it's flow phenomena. It may be flow going by a valve, trying to understand what the turbulence is doing in terms of vibrations to the valve and how that might actually lead to problems. Um, the issue that we're really trying to solve is sensor-based solutions focus on assets uh, and it's really difficult to identify this system and component interactions. Rob touched on that a little bit. Michael, actually, with his example for F1 and, and AMG, uh, that's something that they're doing quite a bit, how uh, interactions uh, with pieces of the car and on the track uh, come together to create an impact on the system, which would be winning races. Um, and then the other thing that we're looking at, and the, the big problem we're trying to solve, and I'll show this in a second, is that sensors and machine learning uh, solutions are great for many, many things but they require a ton of data. And this gets to the question about cost and, and what it really means to be able to do these things. Uh, we think that by bringing model-based solutions to the, the problem, you can actually get away with uh, much less sensor data. You can work, work on sparse networks and you can also tackle uh, big data problems uh, much more easily as well. So if you go to the next slide. So, uh, when I think about uh, industrial intelligence, right, uh, really the evolution of intelligence that led to digital, digital twins, there's, there's really five gens, but I'm going to show you four gens that I think about. One is uh, gen one, it's remote monitoring, right? How do we get sensor data into the system and, and look at that? The next one is how do we apply manual rules to those sensor data? Rob alluded to that, right? So once you have the data, you can start to think through logical steps and, and program that. We've been doing that for a long time right now. Um, and what Michael was talking about is, is AI to discover visible patterns. And, uh, and that works really well in many cases. It takes a lot of work, uh, but it's a big lift. Uh, and then the last thing that we're calling the next generation of industrial intelligence or digital twins is combining physics and artificial intelligence. So physics-based simulation and AI together to give you full visibility 
of what's going on throughout the system, including the subsystems, Rob, uh, and identifying hidden patterns in the data and using this system to quickly run through analyses to make inferences and prescriptions for how to address uh, specific alerts that come up in the system. So if you go to the next slide, Robbie. Okay, so you know what we do is we bring all of these pieces together and ultimately as, as Michael outlined, you know, the goal is about lower energy costs, higher reliability and greater productivity across uh, the different scenarios. And I'll give you an example of what this looks like in a minute. So Robbie, if you go to the next slide. Uh, so what do I mean by uh, combining AI and physics and sensor data together into this mashup? This is a very simple example, but it's very relevant. Uh, so let's say you have a process plant uh, with a bunch of pumps. And what you're looking at here is a representation of uh, two different pump curves. Uh, the black lines show you what's happening from the pump manufacturer, both the pump alone and how they think the pump is going to behave in an idealized system. The problem is that when you take that pump and put it in your system, the pump's going to behave very differently in that system than it is doing in the idealized lab settings uh, for the pump manufacturer. So by combining physics-based simulation, in this case, we're taking uh, simple pump models and combining them with AI, we can actually make the models more intelligent as we're mapping the system so that we actually can have an as-is representation of how your system's operating versus the idealized, idealized sense. Uh, we can then take this much further and do things like combine AI with, uh, with different types of simulation techniques to create very fast reduced order models for incredibly complex physics. Think about a plasma chamber where you're looking at reacting flows, plasmas, all coming together uh, and being able to create a model that can solve that in milliseconds. So if you go to the next slide. All right, that's it. Awesome, thanks a lot, Greg. Uh, so look forward to kicking start this conversation. Uh, glad uh, Matty uh, extended, we have 30 minutes more to do more SmackDown. Uh, would love to start with Rob, uh, particularly if you've seen the Q&A, a uh, bunch of our audience, mem audience members, including myself. Uh, Rob, we just want to get real with you. Um, how much of this concept of digital twin you think has reached the maturation of something that can be introduction, that's something that can make a real difference in the world versus a bunch of MVPs, POCs, uh, maybe even a bunch of uh, like Mike Dolbeck's comments, um, very bespoke handcrafted models, uh, which are really an extension of individual people's imagination and creativity. Uh, what's the something that is ready for massive scale? which doesn't have to depend on individual people uh, or uh, specific conditions or specific deployment scenarios. Um, could you perhaps uh, give us your outlook, whether we are there, how quickly will we get there, uh, or examples where you've seen uh, such a production-ready, massive scale, digital twin already you know, being deployed out there? Wow. I just want to apologize to everyone in advance for all the PowerPoint. I I was not part of that. There's no way. Um, yeah, because I always remember what Steve Jobs said about using PowerPoint. So I feel really guilty. Um, you know what? We've been doing the digital twin thing for a long time and it's had different names. And I know there's a lot of jaded people, probably including myself. They're like, yeah, we were doing that. You're just modeling stuff. We've called it by so many things. And I'm sure your marketing department got a hold of you know, you know, it was a guy, uh, was he at Michigan, whatever, Michael Greaves, who's kind of, you know, started talking about this quite a while ago, you know, gosh, whenever I talk about digital twins, it, it's, I'm totally like the Forrest Gump of technology. And so that's kind of how I try to approach everything, because it turns out more people are like me than they are like the other smart guys on this call. And so what you always have to say, what am I comparing this to? What am I doing now? that digital twins or IoT is gonna do for me that's different or better, you know? It's always great to take you back in time to Apollo 13. Hopefully you all saw the movie a long time ago and you saw the struggle of Tom Hanks and Gary Sinise down there in Houston with the model of the spaceship and they're up there with the real spaceship. And what are they all trying to do? They're trying to solve some problems that to get themselves, they didn't get to the moon and they got to make it back alive. They got, they're, got, they're having to reboot the system. They're probably going to freeze to death and they got to re-enter. And that was a great example between, in this case, two, a, co two, a copy, it was two physical twins really, 
and manpower and people working to solve solutions. That's what we're trying to do today. And so as technology got more advanced and you could build a digital model of the space shuttle, for instance, where instead of Gary Sinise and a bunch of people trying to get a, a square peg in a round hole basically and make things work to take CO2 out of the air, you can digitally model how those processes could work in the same way. It, we just get better at stuff, we get more technology. And so when I, uh, and then, you, and then you, you, know, you had Dr. You know, Michael Greaves quite a while ago who really kind of got things going you know, earlier in the early 2000s with twins. I think twins migrated to manufacturing, that's who took hold of it first. Um, and so you saw a lot of usage of it, you know, back when we had, like when GE Digital was doing its thing with Predix quite a while ago, they were all in with that. The mentioning ANSYS, yeah, they're all in with that stuff. Uh, there's, I've seen digital twin companies a long time ago. So when I'm designing digital twin runtime, like a platform to build and design and then use them, um, I remember being introduced to startups all over the world that were building digital twins that would look like the most complex 3D models I've ever seen in my life. I remember being shown container ships in every last compartment. And they were telling me, this is what a digital twin is. Uh, I'm more pragmatic. I usually think about I'm turning the volume from like one to 10, maybe 11. It just depends. And it's so important to give the customer exactly what they need to get value. And so if a customer can get value from the simple baby step version of a twin, which is just going a little bit past a data schema, you should stop there. My biggest worry sometimes when we talk about things like digital twins or we say things like AI, which isn't typically real when I talk to most people, um, is that we're scaring customers. When you start telling customers the only way you get value from IoT is if you have AI, most people don't live in Silicon Valley and most people get freaked out by stuff like that. They're just trying to do their jobs and they're in a business that's unrelated to technology. And so you do get value today from digital twins. You actually get great value from simple analytics, believe it or not. Um, there's that needle of value that you're getting from IoT telemetry to a twin to some kind of analytics, dumb or smart. Most of that movement of the needle in many cases is happening with the simplest things you can imagine. The needle starts to move less so when you have to, when you're applying like machine learning and some other advanced technology, not always, but I always, I always find it important to bring it all into context that there's value today. People can wrap their heads around a digital twin. I know it sounds like some science fiction thing. It's just really, you know, it makes it easy. It's like, yes, this is my real thing. And then here's my twin thing. And I understand it's got cameras, it's got a screen, it's got all this kind of stuff. It's actually more understandable to people, we, even when you're doing basic stuff like asset management. Anyway, I'm gonna stop rambling. Hey, Rob, I'm gonna jump in there as well. I think that was a good explanation, but I wanna point out that I think that we're barely scratching the surface with digital twins. I mean, we've barely created a transistor uh, that's digital. I mean, we're, we're so far away uh, from a modern processor. And yes, I mean, I, I'm think, I think people are getting a ton of value out of these things, but I think when we use the phrase digital twin, I think it connotes something that is really sexy and exciting. And I think where we are today is uh, more like a breadboard and uh, it works, it does really cool stuff, but we have so many great things to do. And I think, you know, the, the, the point of the question is I, I think really high-end organizations like AMG get a ton of value out of things like AI and the stuff that Michael's doing and, and the sensorization, but that is such a small minority of, of where the world is today. And, and one of the things I'm excited about uh, changing with, with Michael and Rob and the entire community. Yeah, and just to layer in on top of that, I mean, the, the digital twin that I presented for manufacturing yield, um, you know, different people are using that in different ways. I mean, one of the things, um, you know, with the multi-layer chips, you just end up with this explosion of columns. I mean, we used to talk about millions of rows. We're now talking about millions of columns of data. That's and scary. So, and so, yeah, so one of the things that we've done that's been popular is using things like, you know, a time series SACS encoding, where you can take a, you know, a, a sequence of, of data measurements on a, uh, on a time series uh, and then you know, compress it by SACS encoding to find the bits where there's actual signal. Because a lot of the times you take a measurement on IoT type data or time series data, 
doesn't change much for a lot of measurements and then it changes a lot. And so it turns out that those millions of columns, especially with the time series data can be represented you know, using SACS encoding with a fairly smaller, much smaller number, number of columns. And so some of our customers came to us and they're saying, oh, we've got these millions of columns. When we dug into it and we started doing, you know, tricks like SACS encoding, we were drastically, able, you know, able to drastically shrink the number of columns. So then we can start to compute correlations be between the outcome of the manufacturing process like pass and failure, you know, with the, these, uh, what we began with millions of columns, now we're in the hundreds or thousands of columns and it becomes a more, you know, tractable, um, you know, um, problem. So, you know, we've got, we've built out this collection of wide variable, wide data variable selector nodes in our data science product that do that. Uh, and people have like, as a practical matter, even without getting to the full blown kind of yield prediction and so on across all the process variables, they've been able to get some practical value out of just managing uh, the deluge of data and get their arms around just looking at it, which they weren't even hardly able to do before we started to pre-process it in this way. Thanks, thanks, Michael, and thanks for all the responses. What particularly resonated to me was, was Rob's analogy of the baby steps of sensor data, followed by the terrible teens of AI, followed by the middle-age maturation of simplicity combined with AI, where there's a bunch of simpler techniques augmented with AI. It looks like a very uh, organic evolution, uh, which will have some turbulent times, but it will eventually reach maturation and simplicity. Uh, Michael, I want to continue on with you, uh, particularly on the topic of simulation um, and, and help us understand what does digital twin, the topic of digital twins do to simulation? Does it displace it? Does it redefine what simulation is? There's also a bunch of questions here uh, to you, Michael, about simulation. Um, like Dimitri uh, is asking, uh, uh, you know, whether uh, uh, it's, it's a sim ideal kind of simulation for a large fleet of assets like cars, or are they going to be kind of individual car asset level simulations that are running concurrently? I think there's a question from Sanjeev as well here um, about linearity, nonlinearity, whether digital twins enable better simulation of nonlinear behavior uh, at, at much uh, better uh, economic cost. Um, so would love to hear uh, you weigh in on the topic of digital twins and simulation. Well, digital twins and simulation go hand in hand in our work. It's like, you know, you've got a certain number of parameters that you can, you know, use to configure the car in the case of the car example. Uh, and those parameters might be, you know, suspension, ride height, you know, car balance, things like that. Um, and, and you, you know, you've got control in the simulations of changing those and running those through the various models that you've got for the different uh, components of the, of the car. Uh, and then the combination of all those things, um, you know, can come up with, uh, you know, simulations on the, how the car's gonna perform on a certain, on a certain track, on a certain day, on a certain driver. Uh, so it's the combination of things that, you know, becomes exciting that you start to be able to explore. You've got models for different components of it, of the car, and now you're kind of, you know, varying some of the parameters and getting to look at the, uh, the combination of things that you might, you, know, you might vary ride height by, you know, 10 different increments. You might look at that, you know, in combination with uh, tires and car balance, and you start to see how the uh, performance on these um, engineering style mathematical models, uh, and you put them all together, how that changes uh, the overall performance of the car. Now, there's nothing like getting the ground truth of the actual data. And, you know, I'm trained in statistics. Um, you know, I'm an empiricist. I like to build, you know, empirical models versus, you know, uh, differential equation type models. But, you know, rubber hits the road. Sorry for the pun. When you, uh, you know, join those two together, you've got a, you know, you've got a, uh, a prediction from a set of differential equations or physics models. You get some empirical measurements, and now you're starting to, you know, model the gap. You look at the delta between the two. Now you're going to start to see what parameters are important in explaining the delta. That world of kind of the the fusion of empirical methods, which you know I've been trained in, and you know engineering mathematical models, you know that's a really fascinating area because it's like you you start to see the deltas and you start to see how can I can, you know, fine tune what I originally came up with from the simulations as a recommended configuration. It's fascinating to go back and forth between those worlds of uh, physics and, and statistics. Hey, Michael, I'm just gonna jump in there as well. I, I totally agree. And, you know, to the, to the question, I think that digital twins just make simulation so much more relevant. You know, I think that simulation is just starting on its takeoff curve to be applied across the world, even though it's been around for 45 years. And, uh, and applying these methods with empirical methods, you know, using newer math techniques to understand 
what the error estimate looks like and then how you use that to to make the model smarter we're just headed in that direction um yeah no we you know we've done simulation a lot in the past like you know i used to do that as a job when i was my first job out of college was with a pharmaceutical medical device company and we had you know models differential equation models for how the body would metabolize drugs and we would you know different compartment models and you kind of you know look at the rate parameters going from you know the liver to the blood and all this kind of stuff and you kind of get a model for how the drug was metabolized but you know a set of differential equations and then you'd have to go do the measurements in the in vitro and in vivo systems to kind of validate the the rate parameters and so on but I agree with you that, you know, we haven't really done a lot of that simulate modeling and simulation type stuff that, you know, the, uh, the statisticians in drug companies do. We haven't done a lot of that in the, in, the, in the machine world. And I think there's a real opportunity. I'm starting to see this confluence of, you know, differential equations with empirical modeling to, you know, get the actual rate parameter estimates and then re-simulate and get, you know, better optimal configurations. I think there's a real world ahead of us in the engineering sciences that we can learn from some of the life sciences work that's happened over the years. I second that. How many comments? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we were all seconding each other and agreeing with each other. Oh, we're, no. We're, we're the Smackdown part. Come on, we're like the the Smackdown. <laughs> These guys don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> you know, These one thing that would, <laughs> one thing that's going to help next time, Kamesh, you have to wear a wrestling mask. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Yeah, Kamesh, you got to get in the you got to get in the ring with us here, Kamesh. Come on. I know that's a good feedback for the next pack up. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I think just you know, as far as stirring the pot, I, you know, these my two colleagues here are the smart guys in the room, and I'm the Forrest Gump guy here in the I room. I don't know about that, Rob. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> You know, well, some, and, and, it, and the only reason I think I have this attitude sometimes, because I, I know that there's absolutely tons of use cases that you guys are tackling that need that extreme stuff. And, and I totally get it. Um, I'm some, you know, after being in this space for so long, just, you know, all this stuff, whether it's marketing or whatever, digital transformation, this IoT mega trend, sometimes I see some of these trends kind of stalling a bit, stalling out, not meeting expectations. And I, I always wonder why, you know, what are we doing wrong? Um, you know, some of the questions that were asked in the chat, you know, how do real human beings work with this stuff? The, sometimes the stuff we talk about seems like it's from another planet and the average regular person, you know, doesn't understand it. And I feel it's important, or at least it's important to me to lift all boats. I want the whole thing to succeed. This whole mega trend that, that all this collection of technologies that we're using to push forward this, this big, whatever you want to call it, digital transformation, industry 4.0, IoT, whatever mm -hmm. thing forward. And, and so part of me is always, I'm always kind of angling towards simplicity and making sure it's super understandable. Yeah. Um, yeah. And hands-on data. I'm a, I'm a big proponent of that too. I mean, get, getting people, regular people to put hands on data and see, okay, those, you know, 10,000 columns can be represented in, 10 columns, if you do like the sorts of transformations I was talking about, or, you know, just some practical uh, ways to approach large amounts of data. Uh, and then if you've got some smart guys doing mathematical modeling, differential equations and so on that you can then bring to bear along with the empirical data, then a lot more people can get their hands on it. And you, yeah. can, just, and you can just use the, uh, you know, the, the differential equation physics-based models as a starting point. Uh, and really, uh, m m many more people can get their hands on data that's being generated from an empirical kind of visual analytics, data science type world, right? So you're probably not <laughs> using access databases for those, right? No, no, they, you know, there's <laughs> voluminous amounts of data. So uh, there's all kinds of ways of optimizing column the stores to get at it. And, uh, you know, the back end systems of delegating compute down into the data sources to, um, you know, retrieve aggregations, you know, in, in rapidly is, is another whole area of, you know, the data management side of this has got some, uh, you know, interesting challenges in and of itself, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the way I have seen the area evolve is much like how mainframes evolved into personal computers, then evolved into mobile devices. Uh, and there was an era where there were probably 50 people in the entire planet who had access to mainframe. Uh, I feel digital twins were like that maybe three, four years ago. And I think we are just about in the cusp of getting into the personal computing level of democratization, where I'm hoping there are at least thousands of people in the world uh, working with this event. 
Um, I don't know how many years it will take, but I'm sure there will be a time when it will be in the mobile phone type of scale, uh, where half the planet will be in one way or the other influenced or operating through digital twin. Um, uh, great conversation. Uh, loved all your comments and, and uh, grateful for that. Uh, would love to uh, move over to Greg, uh, particularly around the topic of data. There's also been a lot of questions uh, about uh, you know gathering volumes of data, and, and Greg, you touched upon that in your introductory comment. Uh, we have some uh, examples, you know, like uh, uh, professional race cars or semiconductor manufacturing, aviation, where it's very dense data collection. The design of those assets uh, are such that they can collect terabytes, petabytes of data in a day or a matter of hours. On the other hand, you have use cases like utility. You know, we all know what happened in Flint and, and the state of uh, our water utilities here in the, in the U.S., um, other forms of utilities, uh, uh, including uh, you know, what happened in Florida uh, some weeks ago, uh, 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 the uh, electric grids and how uh, you know, kind of uh, age they are in terms of interconnectivity. So there are a lot of verticals where there is really not sufficient access to data and the cost of upgrading uh, those systems uh, are just not viable. There isn't enough uh, you know, tax money lying around after spending or other more politically important areas you know, to improve our infrastructure. Hopefully, the bill that's coming up uh, might allay some of these issues. Um, but Greg, would love to hear your thoughts on how do digital twins address uh, this variety of data access and the cost of data access. Uh, also, Greg, I'm sure you've noticed there, there, there were a lot of questions just about Geminis. Uh, a bunch of people also want to know more about Geminis. I think there's also an industry analyst uh, who had some specific questions. I'm hoping you can also answer some of those questions uh, while you address this, uh, this one. Yeah, I, I will, Kamesh, and I've been answering questions in text offline as well. So hopefully the folks who asked them uh, got some answers and I think everybody can view those. Uh, so first of all, uh, Kamesh, if, if we're gonna get to the point that you just described where we can go from mainframe to BC, PCs, um, I think we're still at the Commodore 64 stage. Uh, and if we're even gonna get there, we have to be thinking about addressing the two scenarios that you talked about. Um, and so, you know, there, there, I think there's a lot of value uh, from digital twins in both scenarios if you're intelligent and understand the system itself. So Rob talked a lot about systems and subcomponents. How things interact together is one of the most important things that we need to be thinking about. Um, and then Michael talked about uh, how you connect, you know, in this case, simulation models with the data and then try to create a neural net out of that. Uh, so one of the things that we're doing at Geminis is using advanced math techniques that do that implicitly and make it easy to take large reams of data and start the search on what the solutions and correlations look for based on the physics. And if you have a, a starting point like physics, you're better likely to find an outcome quickly. And so um, the techniques that we're using applied to big data are extremely fruitful. It's like searching for a needle in a haystack. You can either go through and, and do the hard work and remove every straw of hay, or you can have an x-ray machine that looks in and tells you where the needle is and you can reach in and get it. And so what we're trying to do at Geminis is be that x-ray machine. So that's the big data side of things. I think on the, um, the sparse data, this is another area that is extremely interesting to me. So for us to get um, you know, large numbers of people to benefit from digital twins, we're gonna have to deal with sparse sensor net networks. I mean, there's no question. Uh, most plants, most things out there, don't have a lot of sensors. And I think the sensorization is accelerating really quickly, but even then it's gonna take a long time uh, before we get to you know, trillions uh, and quadrillions of, of, of sensors. And um, in the meantime, this is where modeling and simulation combined with sensor data can give you lots of insights as a digital twin, right? So, so you could think of really simple examples. Um, like uh, let's say it's a, a, a water distribution network in Flint, Michigan, right? The one that you were talking about. Uh, and with a few sensors, if you had a detailed model of that system running in real time, say, and you understood that uh, the flow rate detector, if you had one uh, in one area uh, showed a slight decrease, you would be able to quickly kind of decompose the scenarios that would lead to that decrease and you would identify leaks. Alternatively, um, you might have like four sensors or five sensors in an entire system, but those sensors can provide lots of value, like even a sensor on a pump that tells you the amount of current flowing into that pump is incredibly used, useful in a model-based approach, because if you see the current change, you know something happened, and then you can start playing the scenarios out really quickly to narrow down the number of potential uh, problems uh, and then 
work through it. And the alternative is to, to take an approach with Flint with, where you go at it with really big data, which you may not have. So you have to sensorize the system. You collect all of that data, and then you have to go through the hard part of uh, running unstructured machine learning to try to figure out correlations between the data points. And then you get a starting point and you have to go in and do investigations with technicians to find out what the real problem is to teach your neural net. Awesome. Thanks for your uh, comments, Rick. By the way, I saw a comment here uh, talking about a Nobel uh, Prize winner summit, and apparently the topic of digital twins came up. In my opinion, uh, whoever uses digital twins to improve the sustainability of the planet, that's a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, and I personally believe uh, there will be soon enough uh, a digital twin driven uh, award of Nobel Prize. Uh, whoever cracks one of those fundamental problems that we face across the planet by using a combination of sensor data, digital twins, and, and AI. Um, would love to hear your thoughts as well, uh, Rob and Michael, on this uh, topic of data scalability uh, of digital twins. Scalability. <clears throat> well, you know how things get when you get a lot of data. Um, you know, it's also, <laughs> You know, it's also funny, you know, just, just being so knee deep in the industrial IoT space for so long, you know, we, we talk about, you know, it's it all starts somewhere, right? It's that mass sensorization. You got to have the data from somewhere to start, right? Uh, before you can model things and, and get value. And gosh, part of the, part of the, one of our challenges uh, in the industrial IoT space is just, you have to work with old stuff. We have to work with the world as it is. It's the world of the present. When you know, when you go into a factory, a warehouse, a plant, you know, what do you find? You find machines that are 20, 30, 40 years old. And so the sensorization to begin this process of data capture that does everything else, uh, it's tougher than we thought it was gonna be. You know, I know when the whole IoT thing really, really started taking off, maybe after 2010 or ish, whatever, I think a lot of people thought of it as some greenfield thing and um it, it you know it hasn't been very greenfield uh, as it turns out you know unless you have your race cars of course but the the reality has been more of you know you have to retrofit we're going to spend decades actually retrofitting old machines you know at least another decade re retrofitting old machines to get data from it to make good value judgments based on that stuff uh, and then just and then the, and then to your question, just the mass of data. This is just a normal compu distributed computing problem, right? Um, how do I scale all that kind of stuff? Am I having to run these twins in big clouds in order to to handle that load? Maybe. I often find you know a lot of people love to talk about edge computing. Um, again, I look at edge computing pragmatically a lot of times. A lot of times it's about latency. I just need to be close to the source of the machines. Sometimes it's about governance or security, but a lot of times it's also about the complexity goes down. If I have my big cloud thing and digital twins and AI up there in the cloud handling analytics and stuff across everything on the planet, that's a big problem set, right? On the other hand, if I'm pushed my twins and AI down to edge computing, maybe a gateway or whatever that's near just a handful of machines in a factory, for instance, then the load of what I'm having to do, I know this kind of sounds like it's just another way of doing MapReduce, except we do it from cloud to edge, right? But it's kind of that thinking you have, and it's just, it's kind of, it's kind of practical. If I can do the analytics closer to a handful of machines, then it's not as hard a problem, right? And so, and then I can solve the problem with simpler things with fewer data points from fewer machines. So it doesn't get too crazy, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, for sure. And I, and I think, uh, you know, whatever you can do in a cloud environment or where you've got loads of data as a starting point, and then take that as a portable uh, model and supplement with data at the edge, that sort of hybrid environment we've found to be interesting because you can sort of containerize stuff that you create um, in the in the cloud or in a, um, you know, with, with big data. And then you've got a local, you know, version of what, of what you've done on the biggest system that you can st start to play with locally in terms of like, you know, fitting a model to find an anomaly and then going into like the, uh, the log files or the equipment repair logs and doing a little, um, you know, natural language processing to find out what's happened in the past and maybe uh, just, you know, localize the solution that you've kind of trained up, you know, in a cloud environment that, that kind of works well. 
you know, I'm struck by as we get into this, you know, um, and Rob started off, he talked about, you know, the IoT nervous system uh, as one piece digital twin and then the, the AI part of it as the modeling kind of brain part of it. And, you know, I'm down with that analogy. Um, but, you know, as we get into this more uh, practical kind of data management stuff kind of comes to the fore. Um, you know, we talk about connect as being that IoT part, and we talk about predict as being that AI part, but we've got a third pillar in our portfolio we call unify, and there's a whole bunch of data management problems that you've got to uh, manage, you know, in the middle of that. Uh, and so, you, you know, you talk about, you know, cloud systems, getting connectors to those data sources, um, you know, that are either in motion or event, as event streams or, or uh, you know, accumulated data stores, um, you know, I was on a call last night with one of customers in the Middle East in our energy sector. And, you know, we were talking about getting data from uh, drilling um, operations, WITSML and WITSO type data, you know, getting data from like IoT systems, MQTT, or OPC UA, or, you know, historians, or, or even getting data from SNMP systems and so on. You know, you think about, you know, say EdgeX, Foundry, and all the different sorts of data sources that, are, that you've got to deal with to kind of pull that together. It doesn't just go directly from sensor to AI in you know, a model, right? There's that middle bit of like, you know, uh, federating and gov providing governance around multiple source systems, whether they're in motion or at rest. And I think there's a real kind of layer there that can uh, is really practical to get back to the practical nature of, of sort of take the magic out of it. That I think you know we we're all kind of getting our hands dirty with. Um, but it's also like, you know, if you can kind of virtualize and create a federated view across multiple source systems, whether they're in motion or at rest, and then provide those views into the, um, you know, analytics, machine learning, and also visual analytics layer so that you can, you know, if you know that you've got a certain view of the, of the data, uh, you can build your analytics data science models knowing that that's what you're going to get. And then your backend sort of connect IoT things are then feeding and refreshing that layer so that you can really optimize the, the AI, ML, and visual analytics, knowing you're going to get a certain amount of data. And then the responsibility then is then on your IoT sort of nervous system to continue to populate and refresh that virtual view so that you can be, you know, consistently, you know, innovating on the AI side or, or the visual analytics side and, and know what you're going to get. But then the, you know, you're, you're feeding that middle layer from the sensor piece that uh, gives you that consistency. So Really, I think it's a three layer thing, you know, with the IoT nervous system at the, at the, at the start and the AI kind of brain thing at the end, but that middle layer is pretty important and it, it does you know, bring a lot of practical kind of skills of data management to the table. I'd like to throw that out to Greg and Rob as a kind of a I'm talking. Yeah, Michael, you know, just back okay. to your where the rubber meets the road comment, I, you know, I totally agree with you. I mean, even with static models, um, you know, I can't imagine how difficult it is for you to get a static model of it. Well, maybe it's easier with an F1 car because you have one source of data coming from one organization. But mm -hmm. if you think about a building model, you know, all of Rob's really cool pictures of skyscrapers, right? That's a combination of AutoCAD models, Bentley models, all these different mechanical systems right. and you, just to get the, the static representation of what that building is before you can even plug in IoT data on top of it to get some sort of dynamic representation, let alone modeling uh, right. the things. It's, um, it's a big you know gap. And I, I don't know if there's anybody attending uh, today from, uh, from NVIDIA, but I'm sure the Omniverse folks would be excited to hear about this. And uh, you know, it's what we spent a lot of time thinking about at Autodesk as well, is how do you get data to flow together uh, yeah. and make it easy? Yeah, I mean, data is arriving okay. at different uh, velocities, right? You've got you know, fast you know, data that's coming from some sensors is really fast. You've got other data that doesn't change very often, but they're all very important in kinds of creating that view for doing the analytics and predictions, that combination of data that's coming at different frequencies. And that middle part is where you can practically kind of shape that for, for doing analytics. So the, I think there's a real lot of um, practical things that data management, data stewards can play a big role here. It's not just the, the, the sensor data and the AI on the other end. It's that middle bit that, um, you know, that, that needs work in a lot of That's that. what we're all about is the middle bit. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> everybody, everybody wants to do the cool stuff on the AI side and everybody wants to connect up the equipment. But in the middle, someone has got to like <laughs> pull the data together, right? <laughs> totally. <laughs> so if I may, if I, may I, I want to extend this data management topic, which I think is very crucial. Um, into a complete stack conversation. Like when the internet emerged, we saw the lamp stack uh, and the way TCP IP created a data plumbing, uh, moving data in and out of applications. 
uh, when we saw cloud computing emerge, uh, we saw uh, kind of this DevOps-driven uh, uh, microservice architecture, a lot of uh, user space, data flow, uh, bypassing the traditional uh, you know, client-server kernel architecture. Uh, when we saw mobile emerge, we saw two people control the entire data stack, it's Apple and Google, period. Uh, there is no other data stack outside of those two universes. Um, so Rob, as you also respond to this, and also there was a question, I think you are going to answer that uh, live, uh, around SCADA systems and how, how will how will the stack uh, kind of ingest or ingress data from the physical world? Uh, would love to uh, hear your thoughts on the emerging uh, digital twin application stack. Um, and, and because I, I think at the end of this uh, round of conversation, we might be uh, short of time. I also want to lump another question, um, which is what is the organization that you expect uh, you know, enterprises to evolve uh, as they start building real world uh, you know, digital twin applications? Again, uh, you know, cloud computing created this DevOps organization, which was never heard of before that. Uh, mobile computing, mobile and mobile computing opened up this design, you know, engineering by design thinking, uh, which was never such uh, of such prominence before. Um, so how do you see digital twins uh, redesign the organizations within enterprises? Uh, so uh, would love to hear your thoughts, Rob, uh, over to you. Oh, you really don't want to hear my dystopian ideas for reorganizing organizations, namely the employees. Um, with so much stuff in there, yes, ranging from getting the, the data from old things, modeling stuff. What's that stack looks like? It looks like IoT over here. It looks like some kind of crazy databases or graph databases or other things that are holding that digital twin data and all those bizarre relationships. A lot of it is also kind of a data blending. Um, you know, when we were doing Lumata Hitachi with our avatars, you know, it's not enough just to have that machine data flowing in and hydrating your twin. It's good to have data blending. I need to pull in weather data. I need to pull in data from all of a customer's existing business systems, right? Because you you create context, right? Or, and, and where things make sense. You know, I'm getting data, telemetry data from device number 75. What does that mean? with all these weird data points. You, you tie all those things together and you add context so it has better meaning. Um, gosh, the analytics, you know, we all talk a good game, but we all know that most of the time is spent doing data engineering, uh, which is cleaning data, which is a real bummer. Uh, hopefully some magic can happen where that goes away. Um, changing an organization, I'll just, all right, just, just really stir the pot. I wrote a couple of blogs about this. This is really bizarre. This will sound like a sci-fi movie. I really, th so when I think of a digital twin model, it's a definition. So one of my thinkings around change, this is almost like, how do we apply HR, HR and digital twins together? Whoever would have thought we'd say that in the same sentence. A role, a job at a company, what is that? It's just a series of tasks that need to be completed. You've probably read stuff about the jobs to be done, right? And that's. And that's what a person does. You, you hire a human being to, because there's a series of tasks that you need them to do, and maybe they're roughly similar, and you call that a role or a job. Uh, and then those people interact with other people, um, you know, in, in their group, in different departments, with customers. So you could imagine using a digital twin model to define that role. Maybe not unlike an employee handbook. Just like when I talk about digital twins to most normal, regular folks, and I use the car, I say, well, open your glove compartment and look at the owner's manual. That's, that's the beginning of your digital twin. Well, in an organization, defining the roles for all the jobs in an organization could be defined by a digital twin model. Interfacing with different employees, different departments, different systems, that could be APIs, right? Um, Anyway, it's kind of bizarro. You can imagine a scenario in the future, you know, we, we obviously you've had these mega trends, these things around automation, like robotic process automation, this RPA thing that is, you know, automating a lot of tasks. Remember, like in the 1990s, tens of millions of business apps were written with, for Windows, Win32 stuff. That's aside from the fact that most, the financial system is still being run on mainframes and COBOL globally. The rest of all business is still today being run by Win32 apps written for Windows back in the 90s. Everything else is really pretty small compared to that, which is why you had things like RPA automation that can automate clicking on all these different Win32 screens that were built in Digital Basic and stuff like that back in the 90s. 
Well, you can imagine defining roles and tasks and interfaces with people and customers in the way we model twins in IoT. I know that sounds really bizarro and who knows if we could pull it off. But anyway, there's my bizarre way of thinking about how you could change the organization. You know, if anything else, it could be like we originally used to call PDAs back in the 90s, your palm. Um, it's your assistant. Even if it's not going to replace you, it's, it might be a nice thing to have as a helper, right? You know, you know, hey, these are what you're supposed to be doing today. Here's what your role is. Who's who you're supposed to talk to? That kind of thing. A, a twin model actually can be used in that. So there you go. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in as well, Rob. I think, um, I don't know what jobs are going to be created uh, yet. And I, I don't think we can, we can see. And I think Rob painted a really interesting future but I do know what types of skills uh, are coming down the pike, right? Um, and you know, as digital twins kind of come about, they are going to free us up from a lot of administrative skills. Um, you know, right now, digital twins are made with a lot of heavy lifting that's going to get automated, like you know, democratization of every technology in history. Um, but that's going to leave us with a new set of skills that we always talk about in industry. But I think we're going to see more and more of the need for the rise of critical thinking. You know, digital twins give you an idea of what's happening and what's going to happen. And you as the human being need to figure out what to do with that information. Uh, you have to figure out how you're going to make the car go faster. Uh, you have to figure out uh, how to optimize your day. How do you want to use the, the one hour between lunch that you've just carved out because uh, you had a, have a sophisticated assistant that's told you that uh, if you move some meetings around, you can free up time. So I, I think this critical thinking piece is going to be criti uh, key uh, as digital twin twins uh, hit the market. Awesome. Michael, what do you think? Utopia, dystopia? Yeah, <laughs> sorry. I was like deep in the answering of all, there's so many questions out there. I just get sucked into answering all the questions that I, I've heard Greg stuff before. So apologies for not uh, being able to dive in here a little more detail. Maybe, uh, maybe Rob should take this one as I come out of uh, question answering hell here on the sideline. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, uh, Michael, uh, really appreciate, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, demystifying simulation for all of us. Uh, I learned a lot about simulation, although, uh, you know, I've, I've seen simulation, I've worked with companies like Ansys, but your insights into simulation were very revealing to me, and I'd like to see many other audience members. Uh, particularly, there's this question around the column uh, compression algorithm you mentioned. Uh, there's a lot of buzz around that. Uh, I, I hope you can get to answer that as well. The, yeah, I mean, are we going to trap these answers? Because I'm doing a bunch of typing here on the side. <laughs> we, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm putting them out there, but it's like there's some really good questions here. People are asking about, you know, adoption at scale. And I just got, you know, tied up in a, answering a question about how to model and master and manage the shared data assets as we got into that, you know, thread on data management. You know, there's a whole bunch of stuff there, you know, match and merge and data lifecycle and versions and, governance and workflows and, uh, you know, permissions and- uh, Lions and tigers and bears yeah. and all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of wild animals in that middle layer. There really is. Yes, yes. <laughs> the questions so, so are being captured. Oh, good. Uh, okay. So you guys know, yes. And thank you, Databees, for making our speakers really work for it today. Holy <laughs> yeah, moly. <really. laughs> We're in the cage with the animals here, all three you of us. Guys are crazy. It's amazing. <laughs> I'm so glad we extended it today because, wow, we I don't even think 90 minutes was enough. But um, anyways, back to, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to let you guys know, since we're talking about the questions, that um, I will be downloading them. I'll try and clean it up, and then I can even send that out to everyone afterwards. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. cool. Perfect. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of offline conversations coming from here. Um, so guys, maybe, you know, we, we kind of uh, start wrapping up this conversation. Uh, I personally thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm really grateful to each uh, one of you uh, for kind of playing along with this rather radical format, Smackdown format. Uh, it gives me more confidence. <laughs> uh, you're going to see me with a mask next time. You're going to see more Smackdowns in the high think tank. Uh, it's going to be a whole new series of events. Uh, and, and really, really, uh, from bottom of my heart, I'm very grateful uh, to, to all your effort in making this such a wonderful success. Uh, happy to hear any closing thoughts before handing it over back to Matty and Ravi. And my only closing thought is, you know, I really do enjoy every second Sunday getting up in the morning and turning on ESPN and watching the next F1 race. And this weekend <laughs> we're in Portugal and, uh, you know, that Red Bull car is a bit of a worry. So uh, folks can send, uh, send out some good vibes to the Mercedes team this Sunday. Uh, and uh, get up and uh, join me on the Sunday morning, then uh, that'd be fun. I will be there. 
Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, this is great. This is really good. Uh, and yes, you know, like speaking of ESPN, that's a great way to, to do a session with a lot of folks. Be irreverent and fun, like watching Sports Center, right? Yeah, right. Um, yeah, it's all good. It's all good. Too much of the world is serious during the week. So this yeah, is good. Yeah. It was kind of felt a little bit like, you know, the uh, three commentators sitting around after a college basketball match or something talking about the uh, what happened. It's kind of felt a little bit like that today. So uh, exactly. You need Charles Barkley to be there. Yeah, right. We get Charles. <laughs> <laughs> Kenny Anderson, Charles Barkley. Those guys are awesome. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, Kamesh, totally. I have to say that I really love the diversity of the panel. I mean, really, you know, having sensor folks, having AI uh, folks on board uh, and, and, you know, involved in data is really, really cool. Um, you know, I haven't seen a group like this come together to talk about digital twins. Uh, and this was so much fun. Absolutely. Endorse that. That was really Great awesome. stuff. Yeah. Thank, thank you all for thank making you. this such an exciting event. And thank you, Maddie, for, for putting this all together. Oh my gosh, I had so much fun. Thank you guys all for coming. Thank you to our speakers, uh, to Kamesh for moderating. This was such an amazing time. I will take it as my personal mission now to go out and make custom hive wrestling masks. I think that should be a thing where we do this kind of thing and we have everyone go on the webinar and wear different wrestling masks, maybe. I don't know. Um, but that was this was just so much fun, you guys, and just great conversation. I learned so much as uh, more of a lay person or somebody in marketing and HR, I felt like I was really able to follow along completely. And I'm so interested and I'm just so excited by what I learned today. So thank you guys. I had a great time and database. I hope you did too. Please join us if uh, next Thursday for our session on space, I will send that link out again. And thank you all for staying on so late. Really appreciate it. Thanks everyone. Hey, thank, thank you. you. Cheers. Thank you so much. Yeah, bye -bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.